we're talking about block ciphers, and we've mentioned that one of the, the earliest ones and widely used was DEST, the Data Encryption Standard. To demonstrate how it worked, we went through an example of simplified DEST, so a cut-down version, just a toy version of the real DEST. And we went through an example where we took an 8-bit input plain text and produced an 8-bit output cipher text. It used two rounds. So we went through those steps of key generation, encryption. Remember, it's really made up of permutations and substitutions, P boxes and S boxes. The permutations just tell us to rearrange the bits in a fixed manner. It's always used in the same permutations. And the substitutions, again, are fixed. The S boxes define that take some bits in and substitute them with some other bits, as defined by these two matrices. And we went through and our example. We went through, took a long time to go through for one round. And I gave you the solution for the, the ciphertext. So we got to a point where we swapped the halves. And then you do everything again, which you did for homework. And you should have got this at the end of the second function. The last operation is the inverse initial permutation. You take this in, and the ciphertext, the answer was these 8 bits, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. So that's the simplified DES. And real DES uses some, the same concepts, but on larger blocks and uh, more times, more rounds. Just briefly, the inverse initial permutation, what is it? How do you find it? Right, an inverse operation, if you apply the, the normal operation on some input, so we take some input, we apply IP, we get some output, then if we apply the inverse, we should get back to the original input. That's what an inverse is. That is, if we take uh, 8 bits, apply IP, what is IP? In this case, it's defined. We get the bits rearranged such that the second bit becomes the first bit and so on. The inverse of that should be such that when we take our output, output 8 bits, apply the inverse, we should get our bits back in the original order. That's what the inverse defines. So you need to work out what that is. And I, I can't remember. What is it? 4, 1, something. 4, 1, 3, 5, 7, 2, 8, 6, something. Okay. All right. So just remember, an inverse operation is that if we apply that operation followed by the inverse, we get the original input as output. That was a minor thing. Any questions on simplified deaths? So maybe unsimplified deaths, the real one. First, in simplified deaths, we could write the operations as a set of functions. For example, to obtain the ciphertext, we take as input plain text. We apply the operation of the inverse of the initial permutation. We apply some function f using key k1. So that's a, a shortcut way we can write that, where that function is in fact a set of steps, much more complex. Then we swap the halves. Then we apply the function again, but using k2 as input. And then we do the inverse initial permutation. And if you look at the decryption, it can be written as this. Take the ciphertext, apply IP, apply our function with k2, swap the halves, apply the same function with k1, inverse initial permutation. They are the same operations between encryption and decryption. 
The only difference is that we use the different inputs. So, of course, encryption takes plain text, decryption takes ciphertext, and we use the keys in a different order. So that's a nice feature of algorithms which, when the encrypt and decrypt operations are the same, we can use the same code, the same hardware to implement it. That's useful. How good is simplified DES? It has a 10-bit key, meaning there's 1,024 keys. You can do a brute force attack very easily, so that's not good. But the operations that it uses, it's quite hard. If you know a pair of plain text ciphertext, so you know that this ciphertext was generated by encrypting this plain text, then it's hard to find the key. Right? There's no proof of how hard it is, but uh, it's just demonstrating these concepts of permutations and substitutions makes it hard to find uh, the key given a pair of plain text ciphertext. So that's a good feature. Compare it to real DES, which is what we care about. Some numbers here that compare uh, S simplified DES takes 8 bit blocks, real DES 64 bits. So we take 64 bits of plain text at a time. Real DES uses 16 rounds. That is not just two, but we do it 16 times. But it's the same thing, the same function is just repeated 16 times. Uh, a few other numbers there. We actually start with, and I've said it before, we start with a 64-bit key, we throw away 8 of the bits, giving us effectively a 56-bit key, and we generate 16 round keys, so 16 sub-keys. In simplified desk, we created K1 and K2, just two round keys. The in invert or the in initial permutation is 64 bits and, and a few other numbers there. There are eight S boxes, not two. And the encryption algorithm basically looks the same as simplified desk but extended. Take the plain text, initial permutation, apply our function with K1, swap, apply the function with K2, swap, and so on. Keep repeating and do that 16 times, and then the inverse initial permutation. Those details, and again, just here for reference, are listed in the next few slides. So these are taken from the textbook, some pictures that show the design of real deaths. But if you have a look, you'll see it follows what we've seen with simplified deaths. IP, round 1, round 2, round 16 and then the inverse. To do that we generate keys, sub-keys. The key generation uses left shifts and permutations. What is the initial permutation? Well it's defined here. Again known, known to the attacker as well as those encrypting, and the inverse. But since we have 64 bits, it tells us if you write those 64 bits down, how to rearrange them. The 58th bit goes into the first position, the 50th bit into the second position, and so on. Expand and permutate the different P functions. The details of one round, which is the same as the same concepts as simplified deaths. Take our left and right half, expand and permutate, XOR with a key, S box, permutate, XOR with the left half. So that's the same concepts that we saw with simplified deaths. And there are different pictures that try to illustrate that. The S boxes are given there, there are eight S boxes. It's looked, because it's a larger matrix, it's a slightly different way to look up. I think it takes six bits in and produces four bits out. And a few other details. Let's go to the design issues. Is it good? What are its weaknesses is what we care about. Uh, first we'll say that generally people consider DES to be a strong algorithm. The key is bad. The key length is too short 
It's brute force attacks are easy, but the algorithm design itself is considering it was designed uh, 40 years ago or so, is considered uh, still good today, effectively. That is, there are no large weaknesses that have been found in it, that have been uh, publicly available. There are some theoretical attacks on it, but we'll see that they're not really practical and, except for a brute force attack. One way to measure how good a cipher is, there are different ways. Okay? How do we know if one's better than another? One way we'll introduce here is called the avalanche effect. So we'll explain it and then we'll say that DES has this feature, which is a good thing. Remember we'd like cipher text to be random on the output. So we take some structured plain text, produce random looking output. The avalanche effect is some way to measure that if we take two different inputs which are similar, that those, the resulting outputs will be very different. And in fact, uh, it can be used to measure how good that is as the cipher is applied. So I'll explain it with a couple of examples. First, just some basic concepts. With real desk, we take 64 bits in. Just a reminder. and we get 64 bits out. Consider two outputs and two inputs. So we take P1 as in and what comes out when we encrypt with DES is C1 and we take a different plain text, P2, and encrypt using the same key. We get C2. So, DES would say key K1. Encrypt plain text 1, we get C1. Encrypt plain text P2, we get C2. In both cases, using the same key, K1. What we'd like is that two different plain texts which are very similar should produce two different ciphertexts which are very different or again random looking ciphertexts. How different should C1 and C2 be? If we compare two different ciphertexts, how many bits do you th expect to be different? 64 bits would be different. So you t let's say C1 is all zeros, you would expect C2 to be all ones. So think about the two ciphertexts that come out and think if you want to measure how, how are they different, by how much are they different? On average, if you compare two different ciphertexts, how many bits do you expect to be different? It should be about half on average. If you think about it, let's say the the ciphertexts are random. A random sequence of bits, C1, and C2 is another random sequence of bits. On average, you would expect half of them to be different. Not all of them. Okay, we'd expect half of them to be different. So what would we aim for if we compare the two, C1 and C2 generally differ If we compare any two ciphertext values, we'd expect them to be differ by, different in 32 of those 64 bits. That's a, the aim that we like if we're producing a measure of random ciphertext, is they all always differ, not just by one bit. If I think C1 and C2 differ by just one bit, 
Yes, they are different, but we say they're very close to each other. Okay. Sometimes they may be different by just one bit. Some may be different by 64 bits. Some by 60 bits. On average, if we compare all sets of ciphertext pairs, then we'd expect them to be different by 32 bits. If you don't believe me, or if you don't understand that, then try it. Choose some random, uh, cipher, uh, random numbers, but let's say with four bits. Okay, two, choose two random four-bit values and compare the number of bits. Count how many are different. Is the first bit and the first bit the same? And so on. Then do it again with another pair of random four-bit values and count how many are different. And keep doing it many times and take the average number of bits which are different and you should get about two in that case. Half of the number of bits. Sometimes many bits will be different. Sometimes few bits will be different. On average, half of the bits should be different. So that's what we expect. Given that, the avalanche effect is a way to measure that if we take two inputs which are very similar, maybe differ by just one bit, we'd, ex we'd like the two outputs to be very different. And by very different, we mean on average differ by 32 bits. That's what we'd like. And we can use this to measure, does this algorithm have the avalanche effect? Does it, a small change, lead to a large difference? An avalanche is something small moves at the top of the mountain and it has an impact on other parts of the mountain and at the end there's a large impact that is all the, the snow or rocks are falling down. The same here. A small change in the bits at the start should cause many bits to change as we go through and apply our cipher such that at the end we have many bits different. That's the idea. Let's see the example to explain that. The way to test, take our cipher, take two different inputs, say two different plain text values, and in this example plain text one is this, it's written in hexadecimal but it's a 64-bit value, and plain text 2 is another 64-bit value where it turns out they differ by just one bit. If you convert those numbers to binary, you'll see here the first will be, what, 0, 0, 0, 0, and the second would be 0, 0, 0, 1. All the other bits would be the same, so they, the two different plain text inputs differ by one bit. We'll encrypt them with DES using the same key. And this is the output after we go through each round in DES. So we'll explain what this means. So we start with two different plain texts, P1 and P2. And this column, delta, shows us the number of bits which are currently different. Currently it's one to start with. Remember DES uses 16 rounds. And this table reports after each round the, the current output and counts the number of bits. So if you encrypt P1 after the first round you end up with 3CF so on and if you encrypted P2 you would end up with a very similar value. In fact after the first round they differ just by one bit same as the input. But then if you encrypt Again, that is you use the second round of DES, so this is internal to DES, you get these other two different outputs but they differ by five bits. And if you try measure after the third round and keep looking, after about four or five rounds you'll see the difference between the outputs is around 30 or varying around 32. So it gets up to 34, 37, it comes down. Uh, and then goes up and down, we'd like it to average out to be around 32 because that's what we'd expect. Two different inputs produces on average 32 bits are di different on the output. What this is showing is two things. First, after applying DES all 16 rounds, the input values differed by one bit 
the output values differ by 32 bits, which is right on the average that we expect. That's a good thing. Two different inputs will produce two completely different outputs. But another characteristic we see in here is that internally in DES, after just three or four rounds, we start to get completely different outputs. So the subsequent rounds really are not doing much in terms of adding randomness to the output. But they are included just to make sure for sh that it will be random on the output. The point is that we get to this random looking output quite quickly, which is a good thing. If DES was designed to just use two rounds instead of 16, then in this case the output would differ just by 5 bits, which would be bad, in that the output is very similar and the input is very similar. But if we go for four rounds, then it would have differed by 34 bits, which is good. If we implemented just six rounds, it also is quite good. Remember that we only expect on average to be 32. Sometimes it will be more, sometimes slightly less. But we, around 32 is what we expect. So this is showing that two things, that DES has this avalanche effect in that two different, very similar inputs produce two different, by a lot, outputs to random looking ciphertext and that the use of rounds helps after a few rounds it's maybe not so good after two or three but after four five six it achieves our aim and other ciphers can be tested in a similar way and see well how many rounds do we need do we need 16 why not go to 32 rounds or a hundred rounds any performance is a problem. The more rounds, the more time it takes to encrypt. So it's a trade-off between few rounds to make it encrypt fast and more rounds to make it more secure. So the designers chose 16 as this reasonable trade-off of you want more than enough to be secure. Seems like five or six are enough in this simple case. This was changing the plain text by one bit. The alternative encrypt the same plain text but use a different key. So the second example shows that case. Plain texts are the same to start, the delta is zero, but we use a different key but differs by just one bit. As we go through we see we get to our about close to 32 after a few rounds. Okay, so it's, the avalanche effect is present in DES. Small changes lead to large changes. That's a good thing about the design of DES and, and it's one measure of uh, that it is a good design. And it's something we saw, and I'll jump back to it just to remind you. Uh, It's something we saw, the concept here. Remember, in our rows column cipher, we had an example where we encrypt once, we get some output which had some structure. The characters were differing by seven. But we encrypt again, we apply a second round, and we get a more random looking output. This is this concept of repeating the, the basic operations can give more random output as we go. So, a, so DES is good with respect to the avalanche effect. The key size of DES is bad. It actually starts out, you must choose a 64-bit key, but 8 bits are used for parity check, which means you only use 56 bits in the encryption. So an attacker really only needs to work out 56 bits. 56, 2 to the power of 56 is about 7, what is it, 70 million billion keys. In 1998, the, an organization built a machine which would break DES 
using brute force within three days. It cost 250,000 US dollars. Nowadays, it's considered too, too easy for brute force attack. So 56 bits is too short. How to improve that? Use a longer key. And we'll see shortly that there are versions or modifications to DES. Instead of encrypt DES with a 56-bit key, encrypt two times using two different keys, effectively, effectively doubling the length of the key. Doubling what the attacker needs to guess. Not, sorry, doubling the length of the key, making it much harder for the attacker to guess. And even triple DES, three DES. We'll, we'll explain that in a bit of depth in the next few slides. Use the same algorithm, but use a longer key. There are other theoretical attacks on DES. And we will not get a chance to cover them. I do not understand all of their details. Timing attacks involve looking at how long it takes the hardware to encrypt something. And when you encrypt using two different inputs, it may take a different amount of time. And try and work out by measuring the time it takes the computer to encrypt or decrypt and try and work back what is the key given those time differences. That's the general concept of timing attacks. By observing how long it takes the implementation to encrypt or decrypt, you can learn something about what the input was. There are no known useful attacks on death in terms of timing attacks. Timing at attacks can be prevented quite easily by just adding some random variations to the implementation, but they, they reduce the performance. There are some theoretical atta attacks called differential cryptanalysis and linear cryptanalysis. Differential cryptanalysis looks at, similar to the avalanche effect, effect take two different plain texts and observe how they're modified as we encrypt them and try and use that information to work out what the key was. The attacks on DES can defeat DES, that is, find the key, by applying 2 to the power of 47 encryptions. Remember, brute force would take 2 to the power of 56 in the worst case. With 56-bit key, brute force would take 2 to the power of 56 encryptions, or on average, 2 to the power of 55. This attack is much better in that it takes less operations and therefore less time. 2 to the power of 47 is, uh, what, maybe 250 times less than a brute force attack. So if a brute force attack took, uh, took one year, then this attack would take uh, maybe one or two days. That's the comparison. So it's faster to break deaths. But the problem is that to work, you must have some chosen plain texts. What's a chosen plain text? Remember the, that confusing slide on the different attack classifications? Chosen plain text. What's the definition? What's a chosen plain text attack? If you can't remember, go to that slide that lists them. Go back and find chosen plain text. We know the algorithm, we know the ciphertext in all cases, and we've been able to choose a plain text, get someone to encrypt that with the same key and get the corresponding ciphertext. Maybe we'll just explain that a bit more. Uh, so, brute force on deaths. How many operations to brute force? The worst case is that we have to try every possible key. 
with 56 bits, 8 bits are unused, with 56 bits, 2 to the 56, uh, op I'll say operations. Whether it's an encryption or a decryption, it doesn't matter because they in fact take the same amount of time. So to break DES, it takes 2 to the power of 56 operations. We could convert that to time if we knew how fast our computer was to do one operation. But we usually compare in terms of how many encrypts or decrypts. What's the average case? By worst case, I mean the attacker tries all the keys and once they get the right key, they stop. The worst case is that the last key that they try is the right key. Okay? We try every possible key. We're very, very, very unlucky. And the last one we try is the correct key. That's the worst case. What's the best case? One. Okay? I start choosing keys to try randomly, and I'm very, very, very lucky, and the first one I choose is correct. That's the best case. What's the average case? It's half of the worst case. That is, sometimes we'll be very, very, very lucky, sometimes very, very unlucky, and other times in between, if we take the average of all those cases, it will be half of the worst case. And that's what we often care about, either the worst or average case. It'll be 2 to the power of 56 divided by 2 operations, which is 2 to the power of 55. Not much difference, really. If it takes me uh, one day in the worst case, it takes me half a day in the, the average case. We save a bit, but not much. That's the brute force on deaths. To do a brute force, what do we need to know? What does the attacker need to know? The algorithm that we're using deaths. Well, we always know that. What else? They don't know the key. They're trying to find it. To do the brute force attack. Not after, but before. We need to know the ciphertext. That's it, really. All we do is take the ciphertext, decrypt using DES, and then check if the plain text is correct or not. And we assume that we've, we can check that it's correct or not. If not, try another key. Let's consider a different attack, the, what was a linear cryptanalysis where we had, we said, known plain text. I'll come back. That is, sorry, differential cryptanalysis, this one, where we have chosen plain text. I've made a mistake. Don't copy me. Chosen. It's right, the full name. Differential cryptanalysis. It's a chosen plain text attack. Okay, so there's some attack where they take advantage of uh, when you encrypt two different plain text values, you compare how the output differs and how the algorithm pr progresses and try and work out from that some part of the key. And you do it many times, you can eventually find the key. The analysis of this says that on the average case, they can do it in 2 to the power of 47 operations. So that's the measure of time. So it's much better than brute force. It's faster. 2 to the power of 8 times faster, or 256 times faster than brute force. So that's good in this attack. But what is known by the attacker in this case? Again, we assume the attacker knows we're using DES. It knows the ciphertext. It doesn't know the doesn't know the key. Chosen plain text means that 
In addition, we know that there's some plain text, I'll deny as P1, and some ciphertext C1. And the ciphertext was obtained by encrypting the plain text with the same key as what we're looking for. Okay. So the key we're looking for was used to encrypt P1 and obtain C1. And we as the attacker know P1 and C1. We don't know the key. We're trying to find it. And this P1 was chosen by us. That is, I chose the exact plain text as the attacker. For example, what I did somehow is I chose the plain text to have some structure which I know will start to reveal a weakness in the algorithm. I choose a plain text and somehow I get the person to encrypt that and send me the ciphertext. Maybe that's possible. Okay, you, the encryption is happening as part of some... Um, or I, I get you to believe that the plain text is from someone who you are communicating with. You encrypt it and send the ciphertext and now I've discovered that plain text and ciphertext, I still don't know the key. So there are ways in which we can get someone else to encrypt. This attack assumes that I can choose the plain text and find the corresponding ciphertext, but I don't know the key. I'm trying to find it. And I chose the plain text based upon my, my knowledge of the weakness of the algorithm. And I don't just do one pair, but I have another pair. I've managed to do it multiple times. This attack assumes how many pairs are known. Not 47, 2 to the power of 47. P 2 to the power of 47. C, 2 to the power of 47. So this is a theoretical attack where it assumes the attacker knows the algorithm, the ciphertext, plus 2 to the power of 47 pairs of plaintext ciphertext where all of those pairs the attacker got to choose the plaintext. That's practically impossible for the attacker to be able to do that. It would take a long time to get someone to encrypt that many pairs. So this is a theoretical attack, and the weakness is that the attacker needs so many pairs of plaintext ciphertext. So it's faster than brute force, only if we know all these pairs. And 2 to the power of 47 is, uh, what, uh, again, close to a, a million billion different pairs of plaintext ciphertext. So it's a theoretical attack in this case. We call them plain, known plaintext pairs. Maybe, again, I make this mistake. Chosen plaintext. Not just known, not just any plaintext, but plaintext values which I, as the attacker, got to choose. Chosen plaintext pairs. And that's hard for the attacker to do in practice, to be able to get someone to encrypt all those pairs that I get to choose. So in fact, attacks on ciphers, we don't just measure with respect to time, we measure with respect to how much information is needed to do the attack. Linear cryptanalysis, there's another type of attack. The idea is that the substitutions and permutations try to write an equation that think you try to write a linear equation that takes as an input the plain text and produces the cipher text and then solve that equation or invert it that's the idea there's an attack that will break deaths and about the same time as this one about 2 to the power of 47 operations 
it requires 2 to the power of 43 known plain texts. Known plain texts are plain text values of any uh, structure. They don't have to be chosen by the attacker. So that's a little bit better. But still, 2 to the power of 43 is, uh, again, a million billion different messages have to be encrypted. So it's not practical. So there are theoretical attacks on DES, but only known successful ones are really, uh, well, the only practical ones are brute force. Questions before we move on from normal DES? So this is coming back to those classifications of attacks. We've given an example of a chosen plain text. The, the idea is for the linear approximations, I mean, they're not, not of course simple linear equations, but uh, to try and uh, because it, it is not a linear equation, because the substitution box, the S box, is non-linear. Therefore, you cannot write a linear equation, but get an approximate linear equation that can try and then help. So uh, try and write any form of equation that will help you with discovering the key or plain text without, uh, with just the ciphertext. But they're not something you just easily write down. They're very complex approximations. <laughs> DES was designed many years ago. It was designed in private. By that, mean, by that we mean that the design decisions were not uh, made open to the public. So the research community, when they were designing, uh, were not aware of how the designers chose the different parts of it, like how do they choose the S-boxes? How do they choose those permutations? So that's a problem with DES, and therefore there are many questions about, is it secure? Maybe the designers designed it such that they know of a weakness, but no one else knows of. It turns out, after a lot of analysis, people believe that the S-boxes are good. They, they were designed well. They provide increased confusion. So we'll come back and define confusion. And diffusion as provided by the permutations. So remember we skipped one slide. Diffusion versus and confusion. Diffusion is maybe the simpler one to think of. Diffusion is if you take uh, inputs, say plain text inputs, that input should affect many possible output characters. We should diffuse the, that input across all the possible outputs. It's related to the, for example, the frequency analysis of our letters. Remember if there was a letter A in our input in the Caesar cipher, then there'll be a corresponding letter that occurs at the same frequency in the ciphertext. We'd like to diffuse those statistics, spread them out. That's what diffusion means. Let's go back to the definition. Where was it? Principles. Diffusion is about reduce the statistical nature of the plain text when we get the ciphertext. If the plain text has 12% E's, we'd like the ciphertext not to have 12% of one character. We'd like to have the characters spread out. That's the concept of diffusion. And the way is that the value of a particular plaintext letter, if we consider our traditional ciphers, should affect many output ciphertext letters. And the, the way to apply diffusion is to use permutations and repeat them, followed by some function, like the round function in DES. So the, the design of DES follows this concept. Spread the statistics of the plaintext out across the ciphertext so they're no longer present. Confusion. 
make the relationship between the ciphertext and the key confusing or complex is a better way. That is, if you know the ciphertext, it still should be hard to find the key. So that's the, maybe the simplest view of confusion is to make the relationship between those two entities very, very complex. Because again, the attacker knows the ciphertext, they want to find the key, so that relationship between them should be hard for the attacker to find the key. If it was a very simple relationship, maybe we could write a linear equation that, given the ciphertext, work back and find the key. The way to implement confusion generally is to use complex nonlinear substitution algorithms like the S boxes. In DES, the S boxes provide confusion and the concept of many permutations followed by a, a function, the round function, provides diffusion. There are hard concepts to, to understand sometimes. Claude Shannon come up with these concepts. Remember Shannon? Yeah. Capacity. The Shannon capacity, the same guy uh, come up with concepts of uh, confusion and diffusion and also analysis of the one-time pad. Because it turns out analyzing communication systems, the amount of bits we can send across a link, is similar to analyzing how can we represent uh, plain text bits which have some structure in efficient manners of ciphertext which have no structure. So the similar concepts of encrypting information and trying to send as many bits as possible across some channel. And Shannon uh, studied a lot of those features. Enough on DES, I think. Let's scroll back to the end. To summarize, I think DES was one of the earliest widely used in symmetric key block ciphers and has influenced many other ciphers. It's no longer recommended or used because of the key is too short. But one concept we can do because the key is too short is to have a longer key but use the same algorithm. Because many people used DES, there were many implementations in hardware and eventually software Therefore, it made sense to try and reuse all that, that experience and code, but just extend it to use a longer key. So the concept of multiple encryption with DES. Since DES is vulnerable to brute force, try to reuse DES with a key which is not vulnerable to brute force. And the first approach, or the first idea, is to use double DES. And I'll draw a picture in a moment, or we'll see a picture basically Encrypt your plain text with one key, a 56-bit key, get some output, then encrypt that again with DES ag again, but using a different key, another 56-bit key, and you get the eventual ciphertext. The attacker must guess both keys. Both keys are 56 bits, so the attacker must guess a 112-bit value. So it's effectively doubled the length of the key by using two keys. There's a weakness in that which we'll go through. It's subject to a, a, an attack which makes it not very good, makes it not much better than normal DES. Therefore, people come up with triple DES. Use DES three times. Encrypt with one key, encrypt again with a second key, encrypt again with a third key. So we use three keys and it turns out that there are variations of that. You can use it with two different keys or three different keys and it can lead to the strength that's equivalent to having a 168-bit key. So we'll lead to that in the next few slides. Let's look at double DES and see why it's not good. The idea of double DES or double encryption, not just for DES but any cipher, is take our plain text encrypt using our cipher with key K1. You get some output X. Then encrypt that output X again using a different key K2. Then you get your ciphertext. If we consider DES, then the input plaintext is 64 bits. 
the ciphertext that comes out is 64 bits, and the intermediate value x is 64 bits. In DES, K1 is effectively 56 bits, K2 is 56 bits, so the key length is 112 bits. To decrypt, we do the same, but of course opposite, ciphertext, decrypt, we're using K2 first, we get X. Decrypt the X using K1 and you get the final plaintext. So that's the idea of double encryption. Note that X will be the same at both of these points. X is just this intermediate value. Why is X the same? Encrypt the plain text with K1 and you get X, some value. If you decrypt the cipher text with K2, it's really going backwards from here. Follow this one backwards. C, if you go backwards using K2, you end up here. So decrypting the cipher text with K2 will also produce X. And it turns out that's where a weakness uh, is in this approach of double encryption and a, what's called a meet in the middle attack can be used. Let's use an example to, to illustrate such an attack. We will not do it on DES, of course, but we'll do it on some other cipher just to illustrate the concept of meet in the middle attack. And I'll find my example. And let me just look at your handouts so I can see what example you have in front of you. You have an example, one page, uh, which is this. If you scroll through a few pages, one table, I'll show it on the screen, called example 5-bit block cipher. We'll use that for our example. Let me show the example and just explain it first. So we're not going to use DES, but this same concept of double encryption applies to any block cipher. So I've created a block cipher which is uh, on this table. And we really, it's, uh, we'll use this just to look up the values. And the way to read this is that the left column is the plain text. So if we have some plain text in, like five zeros, it takes a five-bit block to keep it small. At the top is the possible keys. We have a 3-bit key, so there are 8 possible keys. And the way to understand how this block cipher works is that we just do a lookup. If we have our plain text in of 5 zeros, and we encrypt with a key 000, then the plain text out will be this value. That's the way to understand this block cipher. It specifies for every possible plain text, for every possible key, the output ciphertext values. So think of it as a lookup table. And we'll just use it as, uh, rather than having to understand the details of how to generate these values, I just created them randomly. For example, you want to encrypt plain text 00001 with the key 001. You look up that row and column and you get the output ciphertext. So it's just a simple one for reference. Keep it in front of you and we'll see how that cipher, if we use it in the double mode, can be subject to a meet in the middle attack. Let's go through an example of this attack. What can we call our cipher? Anyone? Give it a name. It's not DES, it's some other cipher. Uh, 
the idea, let's call it ABC. All right, Steve was a little bit uh, boring. ABC, even better. The idea is that. So that cipher defined by that table takes plain text in, and we take what? Five bits plain text, three bit key, and produces five bits of cipher text. And let's call it ABC. Brute force attack. So ignoring uh, how the cipher works. Brute force attack. Worst case. How many possible keys? 2 to the power of 3. So brute force on that. Would think about the worst case in this uh, to compare. It would take 2 to the power of 3 operations. Okay. Of course, that's easy, but later we'll expand it to deaths where we have, say, 56 bits and, and also the double version. So now let's consider that same cipher but used in double encryption, where we use it twice. And the way that it would be used is like this. We have our ABC. We take our plain text in. It's also five bits. We encrypt with K1, 3 bits. We get a value out. I'll just for reference denote it as X. X will be how many bits? Also 5 bits. So we just use our cipher to look up and find 5 bits. Bits. But then we encrypt again. We apply the same cipher on X and we get out cipher text, which is 5 bits. And in the second encryption, we use a different key, K2. That's how we use double encryption. Encrypt two times, but use a different key each time. Brute force attack. How many keys does the attacker need to try? Two to the power of six, okay? Two to the power of six. So effectively, we have three bits in the first key, three bits in the second key, or effective length of six bits of our key. There are two to the power of six possible combinations. So let's say the first key was 0, 0, 0. Then there are 2 to the power of 3 combinations for the second key. And then if the first key was 0, 0, 1, then there's another 2 to the power of 3 combinations for the second key. So in total, there are 2 to the power of 6 keys, 2 to the power of the key length times 2. So that's the idea of double en encryption. And I'll just write as a note, if we're using DES, brute force on single DES is 2 to the power of 56. And on double DES, brute force would be 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 112. That's the idea. Which is not subject to a brute force attack. 2 to the power of 112 is 2 to the power of 56 times longer than a brute force attack on single deaths. So that is secure, or considered quite secure, 2 to the power of 12. But there's another attack that we'll go through that makes it weak. And the attack is called the meet in the middle attack. I think we can get it started today. Meet in the middle. Attack. It's not a man in the middle attack. 
We'll see that in another topic. There's something called the man in the middle attack. This is the meat in the middle attack. It requires the attacker to know some pairs of plaintext ciphertext. So it's a known plaintext attack. So we're attacking this double des. Let's say we know... What do we know? We know a plaintext ciphertext pair. as the attacker. And I'll give you the value that we know. <coughs> we know this pair. That is, we know that the, the person with the secret key, the six-bit key, effectively, took some plain text, 01101, and encrypted it and got 11111. So we know those values. We don't know the key. That's what we're trying to find. A brute force attack would try all possible keys, but we want to see if we can do an attack which takes less attempts, less than 2 to the power of 6, and then we'll apply it to real deaths. So what we do in a meet in the middle attack is first we we know that there's two operations, the first encrypt and the second. We do a brute force attack on the first operation, that is on the first key. So we think, I'll we'll show you how we obtain the values. Let's consider P1. The plain text. And let's do a brute force on that using the single version of the cipher. So with the key, how many possible keys are there? With a single version of the cipher? With a single version there are eight. It's a three-bit key. I'll list them. What we do as the attacker is take this plain text and try to encrypt it with every possible key for the single bit version, or the single uh, operation version. How do you do that? Look it up in the table. Okay. So what we're doing in terms of our picture as the attacker is here. We have a plain text. Let's try every possible value of K1. There are eight possible values, and we'll get eight output values of what we'll say is x. Let's do that first and then see how it helps us. So think of this as uh, the, the first key value that we get out, and we'll denote the output. We'll call it x11. Uh, one, one. What's the output when we encrypt 01101 with key 000? zero zero zero? You need to look it up here. Okay, so that's the encryption. The zero 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 is the key. Find zero one one zero one. It's hard to find. It's here, isn't it? Okay, it's easier to see up on your printout. So find the plain text and look for the key and you get this value as output. Then in the next key, it's the same plain text, we'll get this value as output and so on. We'll get eight different outputs with the eight different keys. Let's list them. So in fact we'll get this row of outputs as we encrypt and so on. So I'll write them down so we have them. What do we get? We'll call this x, uh, the intermediate value, x1, 2, using the second key. I'll explain the notation in a moment. What do we get? 
you need to look it up. And I've got the answers in front of me, so we don't have to look up all the time. Uh, but if you look up, we're just grabbing this row. Is that right? Zero zero one one one. The next one will be one zero one one zero, and so on. If you look at that row, the last one I'll just write here is, let's call it X18. It's our first value of X, but for the eighth key. How many operations so far in our attack? Eight operations we did there. We did eight encrypts, so, so far we'll keep track. Eight operations, or two to the power of three in this case. We have to try for every three bit key. We're going to try and do this attack such that it will take us less operations than 2 to the power of 6. That's our aim. So, we do that for our plain text. Now, so think what we've done in terms of our double cipher is that we've taken some plain text and obtained 8 values of x. If we take the corresponding cipher text, which we know, and we decrypt it, so I think go back from here with different values of K2, what we should get is eventually one of the values of X should match one of the values that we obtained from encrypting. Because for the correct key, when we encrypt using K1, we get the value X, and then we encrypt at value of x with k2, we get the ciphertext. Therefore, if we decrypt the ciphertext with the correct key, we'll get a value of x which is the same as when we encrypt the plain text with the correct key. We'll see that as we get to the answer or get to the, the next step. So let's decrypt c with different values of k2. And we know the value of C. C1. And let's try all different keys. Actually, I will not write the keys just to save space. You, you know them. That we're going to try these eight keys again. Okay, So the keys are the same as here. And when we decrypt 11111 with the first key, what do we get? Look in the table, but go backwards. Decrypt that ciphertext with 000. That is, the key is 000. The ciphertext, look it up in this column, all ones. Is it there? The plain text, when we decrypt, should be 10001. Decryption is going in the uh, inverse operation. Given the ciphertext, given the key, what was the plain text? 10001. And in the next case, the same ciphertext, all ones. The second key, where is it? Somewhere there. Here. The plain text will be 00110. So we're decrypting now. So if we decrypt our five ones with the first key, we'll get the plain text and we'll call it X21. First key, but the second value of x we've got now. What's the next value? Uh, 
Let's, so people understand. Decrypt with the second key. Ciphertext, five ones, key zero zero one. Therefore, the plain text must be zero zero one one zero. And keep going, and I'll write them down. You can confirm what those values are. That's the last one, what we'll call x28. How many operations then? Another 8. So, so far we have 16 operations. Brute force, what do we say? 2 to the power of 6. 2 to the power of 6 is what? Brute force would take 64 operations so far. We haven't finished yet, but so far we've taken 16 operations. 8 encrypts, and then 8 decrypts. How do we use that information? Well, the, the idea is that if we've got the correct value of, this is K1 and K2, then they must produce an x value which is the same because encrypting with k1 you get x decrypting some, the corresponding ciphertext with k2 you get the same x so if you've got the correct k1 and k2 you must get an x value which is identical let's look in our values of x's that we got. In fact, we'll see several. What do we see? Compare this x with all the x's here. Which ones are the same? Are there any? No. I think this x11 does not appear in this list. What about this x12? Yes. It matches that. We'll see that. Are there others? No. But what about, I think, this one? 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Does it appear in this list? Yeah, the last one. And I think there's one more. It's hard to look them up, but this one. Does it? Also the last one. Okay. We have three matches. Three x values from our encryption also appear in the x values for the decryption. What does that tell us? It tells the attacker that the possible keys are, what do we got, k1 and k2. There are three possible values. k1 could be, what is it here, 001 and k2, 100. So it could be that that's the, the two keys which were used. Because with the correct keys, the x values must be the same. Because the result of encrypting one time gives us x, and the result of decrypting the ciphertext must give us the same value. But in this case, there are three potential matches. Another possible value of k1 is this, 0, 1, 1. and 111 and a third possible value is 100 and also 111 one of those three values is the correct key we don't know which one yet we didn't need to do it, any encrypt or decrypt op decrypt operations there we just compared values so we will not count that as operations as the attacker, we need to know now, of those three values, which one's the correct one? How do we do it? We don't. We need to know more information. But if we did know more, 
what if we knew another pair of plain text ciphertext? Let's say we also know a second pair. What if we knew this was true? Then test it with these three keys. That is, take our plain text P2, encrypt it with 001, take the output, encrypt that with 100. If we get their ciphertext, that's most likely the key. If we don't, it's not the key. Try it. Find which of those three keys is the correct one. If we take P2 equals 11001, encrypt with K1, the potential K1 of 001, what do we get? Five zeros. Now encrypt five zeros with potential K2. What do you get? One one zero one one. I think we've found it. Okay. That is these two values of K one, K two are correct with respect to our second known pair of plain text ciphertext. Now to be sure that it's these two, we should try the other two. And you can try them and you'll see that we'll try the second one. What if we used the second key? a second potential pair. That is, we took the same plain text, P2, 11001, but the potential K1 of 011, what do we get? Zero. Anyone? Give me the answer. Encrypt plain text with this key. I don't have it in front of me. Again. One zero. One zero one one one. Okay, good. And encrypt that with the potential K2. What do we get? One zero one. Correct? Is this pair, K1 and K2, correct? No. Because if they were correct, they must give this value. They don't. Try it with a third potential pair, and you'll find that that's not correct as well, leaving us with this one. We've found the key the six-bit key in this case. Let's say we try them. I know we've run out of time, but let's... Uh, I know you're enjoying it, so let's <laughs> finish it. K1 was... what is it? 100. Zero, zero. X gives us... someone will tell me. This value? Zero, zero. One at the end. And the final C? All zeros? You need to look these up on our table. That, of course, doesn't match as well. which tells us this set of keys, K1, K2, is wrong. 
the second set was wrong, the first one is correct. In fact, we could have stopped there. It was highly likely that was the correct one. How many operations here? How many encrypts and decrypts? I think we did another six. Would that be right? One encrypt, one encrypt. We did, it in the worst case, six more. Total number of encrypt and decrypts. Two to the power of three plus another two to the power of three plus six. Twenty-two? And I meet in the middle, 2 to the power of 3 plus 2 to the power of 3 plus another 6. We got 22. Brute force would have taken us 64. We've cut it down to 22. With double deaths, such meet in the middle attack in general takes 2 to the power of 56 plus 2 to the power of 56 plus a few more. We had plus 6, but in general it's very few compared to 2 to the power of 56, which is approximately 2 to the power of 57. A meet in the middle attack on double deaths takes about 2 to the power of 57 operations. A brute force attack on single deaths takes 2 to the power of 56 operations. Double deaths is twice as strong as single deaths. Twice as strong is not very strong. If we can break single deaths for $10,000, then we can break double deaths for $20,000. That's the idea. So that's not good improvement. Double deaths is subject to meet in the middle attack. Out of time, have a look at uh, some of those steps. Make sure you can look them up on this table just to understand what was happening for the encryption and maybe we'll just summarise that on the, the lecture next week.